Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. This is Kevin with the LSA, and I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Why Location is the Future of Digital Marketing, and will be brought to us by our guest presenter, Elena, from Exad. Um, during the webinar, feel free to type any questions you may have in the question box on the screen, and at the conclusion of the presentation, Elena will address them. With that, let's get started. Over to you, Elena. Okay, great. Thanks so much, and thanks everybody for joining the webinar today, and thanks LSA for helping us set this up. My name is Alina Greenstein, and I'm the Director of Channel Partnerships at XAD. Our team here at XAD helps publishers and media companies, just like yourself, use location intelligence to understand who your viewers, readers, listeners are, um, and based on real, the real police places that they visit every single day. Um, so mobile right now actually accounts for 69% of all digital media time spent. Um, and actually I just uh, read an article this morning that showed that digital media overall actually just eclipsed TV media for the first time ever um, for this year. So, you know, from targeting to attribution and consumer behavior, I'm sure this is something that's constantly been on your guys' minds. So our mission today is basically to help you guys understand um, how we can explore and observe the places that users visit and how this allows marketers to make meaningful inferences into a, a user's life journey. Um, so we're, we're obsessed with our phones, guys. 91% <laughs> of us keep our phones within arm's reach 24-7. Um, I sleep with it right next to me on my nightstand. It's my alarm clock every single morning. Uh, it's literally right next to me right now as I'm doing this webinar. It's on our desk at work. It's at the dinner table. Um, the average mobile user across all age groups in the U.S. checks their phone, I swear I'm not making this up, at least 200 times a day. And over half of mobile activities happen out of the home, which is a great opportunity to just continue reaching and visiting these places on the, and the places they go. Um, it's starting to really just penetrate uh, our society. So by 2019, uh, smartphone users are actually going to pass 70% uh, of North Americans by next year as well. Um, Four out of every five uh, mobile smartphone users in the uh, four, I'm sorry, four out of every five mobile phones in the U.S. actually are smartphones. I really want to find that last one out of five that still have the flip phones or maybe even the Zach Morris phone I might think about. Um, but especially when you have smartphones, you're checking these phones on average at least 45 times a day. And with the rise of mobility, consumers are now free to live their lives in the real world. So we're no longer tethered to our computers or even our TV sets. We're spending 50% of our time outside of the home. Um, and actually, can anyone guess at what percentage of retail decisions make spur, are made spur of the moment versus pre-planned? Well, Gerard, who is sitting here navigating through, through these slides, just ruined it for you. 80%, 80% of retail decisions are made spur of the moment. And it. This is a remote control that you have in your hand uh, that helps you navigate the offline world, basically. Um, you know, and the crux of everything that we do is highlighted, actually, by the fact that 90% of all commerce actually still happens in brick-and-mortar locations. So think about it. Every item you purchase via Amazon, there are still nine other purchases that are being made in the store. And that's where location-based mobile really comes into play to help influence that next purchase and that next decision. Um, so I want to go through just a couple things about location technology, um, some things you might know and may not know. Um, we've established location is an important indicator of who a person is, but how can we tap into this information on your smartphone? And there are a few different sensors embedded to your smartphone that can actually help. So, for example, these sensors can contribute to information that actually make a lot of the apps on your phone. Um, it makes a lot of the everyday functionality, actually. So, for example, Global Positioning Systems, or GPS, is used to pinpoint your precise location, usually within 3 to 10 meters of accuracy, and shares that information with apps to make them more useful. So, for example, when you open up a weather app on your phone, you want to know what the weather is, exactly where you are right now. So when you download the app and you say yes to all those little modals that come up, one of them is actually um, questions asking you to enable location-based services. And so this, this actually gives the app permission to access the GPS on your phone um, and tell you what the weather is exactly where you are now. For navigation apps like Google Maps, for example, you have things called a gyroscope, which helps indicate the orientation of where you are. 
and an accelerometer, which measures the linear acceleration. And so this actually helps the app track where on the course you are when you, that you've laid out without the GPS actually needing to ping you every second and basically kill, killing your battery completely. Um, a lot of these apps actually do update location information as often as once a minute because, again, when you have location, it starts to make some of these apps really valuable for you. And as a result, we can paint a really accurate picture of a user's life journey with this data. So when you think about it, location kind of defines us. Looking up information on the internet for a consumer is pretty cheap and easy, right? So I can spend hours reading reviews and specs for the newest BMW 5 Series, but that doesn't mean that I'm a luxury auto intender. But, if I'm go but I am going to spend a limited amount of time. Um, we all have, um, but am I going to spend the limited amount of time that I have to go to a BMW dealership unless I'm actually in the market for one? Probably not. So where you are is as important as who you are. And we look to understand who a person is based on where they've been and where they're going in order to um, influence what they're going to do next. Um, so you can also think about it another way. So I get a subscription to Women's Fitness and Shake Magazine, and maybe I'm regularly visiting healthy recipe sites on my phone. But if you find me at a McDonald's three times a week, I'm really not that much of a health enthusiast that you thought I was, right? If you want to reach somebody that you see at an Orange Theory or a New York Sports Club on a regular basis, you probably have the confidence that they're a health-minded individual and the right person for you to speak to. Um, but you guys have heard this shtick before. Mobile's really hard. Cookies don't transfer from desktop to your phone. So what do you do? How can you start to look at these behaviors that are happening in the real world and maybe leverage some technology to allow you to make sense of who these people are? Um, so let's consider the New York City commuter here. Um, Gerard and I here at XAD were based in the Freedom Tower uh, in downtown New York City, so we wanted to use an example that's close to home. Um, so many people ride the New York City subway, um, but who are they? They're moms, they're millennials, they're business travelers, they're all lumped into one big group called commuters. How do we start to decipher these different segments out of one large audience set? Um, so let's maybe just start looking at just one location in particular, Grand Central Station, which is a pretty popular station um, for any of you that have been or know New York City. Um, we can look at some of the basics first. So, for example, the time of day when traffic is highest and lowest. So here you can see um, what the typical commuter pattern looks like with peaks at around 8 a.m. and uh, as well as around 5.30 or so when people start to skedaddle on their way home. Um, then you look at um, foot traffic by day of week. So it actually shows Monday is the lowest, which I guess it really is really hard to get people out of bed on a Monday morning. This kind of proves it. Um, and Saturday, interestingly enough, is actually the peak, um, which represents uh, likely shoppers, uh, a lot of tourists that we see, a lot of other day trippers that we've seen heading through Grand Central. Um, now you can start, so that's the basics, right? But how can we take it a step further? Now we want to really start to think about um, you know, how can we start to use these more stand, like more than just standard data points to do some sort of predictive modeling? Um, so let's just say people who have been to Grand Central Station, what parts of the city are they likely to have come from or to visit next? So what you guys see here is this little heat map. Um, all the different red areas uh, are the ones that have highlighted of places that we've actually seen um, people have uh, gone to after they visited Grand Central Station. So um, the six train actually runs through Grand Central and it services the east side of Manhattan. And so when we look for where people um, were likely to go next, it's actually not surprising that things that lit up were the Upper East Side, Midtown East, uh, the East Village. And if you're from Manhattan or if you've ever seen, if you've ever been to Manhattan, you know that geographically it's small, but crossing the island feels like a trek on the Oregon Trail, and it's actually not very easy to do. Um, so therefore, it's actually not surprising to me when I look at this information and I see pretty much nothing, very little stuff on the west side uh, is highlighted, and actually the upper west side is completely unhighlighted. Um, it's actually not that easy to get from the upper west side to Grand Central. Um, so then you start to also think about other location indicators and data points that help you build up these profiles. Um, you know, like how do I start to understand some of the, the feels of who these people are 
um, and actually build them into audience segments. So the kind of information that is great for operations and marketing, again, time of day that we see people peaking, the days of the week that are highest and the lowest, what's the volume of traffic that we're seeing on average on these high and low days, and who are they? Are they male, female? What's the average age? Um, we actually found that uh, the high, there's a high propensity of being business travelers, which is not surprising considering so many commuters um, go through um, the doors of Grand Central. Um, you can actually even take a look at this just as one single user's life journey. So we actually picked out just one single user's life journey and looked at where they went. Um, that also went on the six train. So um, and you saw that they went from work to the gym, picked up their dry cleaning uh, and grocery store, and we actually started to lay over um, some out-of-home uh, assets that we saw that they could have seen on the way, just as an example. Um, and so when you start to think about it, when you think about the places they go, the brands that they visit, the assets that they pass by, and even the stores that they went to on their way as well, you can actually start to paint a pretty nice picture of who somebody is based on the real-world locations that they visit. Um, and now, all of a sudden, that huge crowd that you're trying to find the right person seems to actually be a little bit simpler and more effective than before. Um, and so from this information, what we're really looking to help, you know, help you guys understand is how can I think about all of these different audiences in the real world? So um, I know that we all think we're snowflakes and we're unique and our real world behaviors just have to be houses, but I have news for everybody. I'm sorry, but you're not as special as you think you are. In fact, we are all actually creatures of habit. And when we visit a lot of the same places with frequency, we can actually start to understand some of the audience groups that each one of us fall into. So actually take a minute to think about the top places you visit every day. So for me, I go from my house to the train, to the office, Sometimes for a mid-morning, uh, sometimes mid-morning to the coffee shop when I need the extra jolt of caffeine because the office brew is just not cutting it that day. Um, my favorite salad place for lunch. Sometimes the grocery store on my way home, and a few cup and a few times a week I try to make it to the gym. Similar to what we walked through with that Grand Central example, you can start to build audience segments based on where people have been and who they are using location indicators and demographic attributes to form audience profiles, which define consumer lifestyles and interests. And this approach to audience targeting actually aligns pretty well with the traditional approach that you guys use already yourselves for your own media. It's just built on location data, which is proven to be a pretty strong indicator of intent. And as you saw in the example right before, there's actually a really easy way to be able to pair this with traditional media as well to sort of put the best of both worlds together. So in the example you see here, an auto intender. Uh, so somebody who's in market for auto could be somebody that has been on an auto lot within a very, very small recency window of time, which is different from, say, a fast food intender, who can be somebody that we see that regularly frequents places like McDonald's or Chipotle or Taco Bell on their um, consumer journey which is very different from a mom um, who maybe has a couple of different locations that she goes to. She hits up the park. She goes to a toy store. You'll see her at a stop and shop probably more than once a week, several times a week. You'll see her at a school. Um, you might even see her going to the gym. Um, and we also want to make sure that she's a female who's 21 plus to make sure that we're actually reaching the right audience segment there. Um, so think about how this can be actually translated to whatever your core media is. Who are your radio listeners who are also health enthusiasts? Who are your news readers who are also fast foodies? Who watches local news and is in the market for a car right now? This behavior can also be applied to your media to help you tell a richer story about the audiences you're already selling by pairing it with the places they go as well. And it starts to help you bridge that online and offline story. Um, and to close the loop, you can also start to use very similar type of data to actually help prove once you reach that audience that they actually end up making it back into that McDonald's or into that Bob's Hyundai to make a purchase. So um, we wanted to do something that I know doesn't typically happen at a webinar. We wanted to try to do a live demo. Um, so hopefully everything works out. Before I have Gerard continue and go into this live demo, I wanted to actually cover off on two 
really important things that I think are important to mention that you need for scalable audiences to be built with appropriate frequency. Um, so it all starts with your data set. Interesting measurement, cool UI, total reach, none of that matters if you don't see a lot of people and often, and obviously in a privacy compliant way. Um, desktop advertising started in the same way, you know, touting high traffic numbers that were actually really just one-time visits. It's really important when you're looking at um, a data set to start to look at things you're probably already familiar with, which are daily active users and monthly active users. So then once you have a, an understanding of what frequency you're seeing people with, um, to build insights, it's important to address precision, which is pretty important in terms of correctly and effectively finding that audience. So this means understanding the actual precise physical boundaries of, say, the Walmart or the airport, not just a circle around them. So actually, the, it's pretty common to just place um, a radial fence around an address and actually when we did some research, we found that 80% of visitors seen in a radial fence don't ever actually go into the business or area of interest. It doesn't mean radial targeting can't be used to drive store visitation nearby. It's absolutely very successful for that. Um, it's just not a precise way of building audiences based on their actual real-world visitation behavior um, based on what we've seen. I'm going to use an example of health enthusiasts since I... I talked about fast food a little bit. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit on the healthier side for the second piece of this. Um, and I want to talk about New York Sports Club health and tenders. So I want to take a look at what are, say, the most popular days of the week for New York Sports Club's members to get their sweat on. Right? So Gerard is driving in into the um, down here to a little bit. So if you just click on the popular days of the week, um, it seems like Sundays seem to be a little bit lower than the rest of the day of the week. Um, you know, not, I'm actually a little bit surprised you don't see more visitation during the weekends because I would think that's when people have a lot more time. But actually, we're finding Monday through Wednesday are when people are finding the most amount of time. Um, so specifically for New York Sports Club, you can see that they over-index Friday, Saturday, Sunday, above the industry average for visitation to a health club, but they're really kind of losing out Monday through Thursday. Um, so let's let's take a look at something else. Um, so let's look at the time of day visitation. So I know that people are going to the New York sports clubs. They tend to over-index Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but when I look at time of day, what's the most likely time they're going to be going there? It actually looks like the morning to noon hours seem to index much higher than the evening hours. So if I'm looking at this, I'm thinking people tend to go on the weekends, and they actually tend to go in the mornings to get it out of the way. And so that's an interesting concept, because if I'm looking at this information, and I'm a radio station, and I want to make some really smart recommendations to my customer who's trying to uh, reach New York Sports Club uh, members, maybe I want to tell him, hey, listen, New York Sports Club, if you want to be able to reach your existing loyal customers, think about um, serving loyalty creative Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the morning hours because that's when they're going. Maybe that's the time that you want to be able to send them a radio spot that gives them that additional boost of encouragement they need to make it to the gym. Um, but if you want to speak to new customers and customer acquisition, Monday through Thursday seems to be the better time for you to do it and especially in the evening hours because those are the times when we're clearly finding that people tend to not be visiting New York Sports Club locations. We can also look at other places that people go to um, by looking at brand overlap. Um, so New York Sports Club is a little bit of a, of a evergreen type of location, so people that go to the gym also need to go to the pharmacy and get coffee and go to the supermarket and things like that. But it's interesting how my example before, of, you know, how we all love to say that we're snowflakes and I'm such a health-minded person. Look at, um, what is it, one, two, three, four, five up from the bottom, McDonald's. You know, I'll give everyone that goes to New York Sports Club the benefit of the doubt. They're probably going to get some of McDonald's delicious McCafe coffees. But if they're going in there and they're also getting um, an Egg McMuffin on a regular basis, um, it's very possible that maybe the gym tends to also be a way that they counterbalance some of the things that they eat. Um, so let's actually drill down even further. 
for individual locations. I want to do some of that predictive modeling again. So I'm actually going to go down and take a look at one that's in uh, lower Manhattan, actually one right by our office here. Um, so we're going to click on one of these locations. And as you can see, the way that the way that I was talking about a radial fence before, that little green blip that you see on there, that's actually how we're identifying who has been to a New York sports club. Um, when you take a look at what the neighborhood view is um, for a New York sports club, for this particular one downtown, you can see that a lot of the areas in the immediate area highlight. So you have pretty much the entire like business district of the financial district. Um, it starts to go up into the village a little bit. Um, so you can probably assume that people that live and work in this area probably visit this particular New York sports club. Um, but for any of you, again, who are from New York or from the New York area, and you know that if I look at, if you go back to a New York sports club in Jersey City, you just drill down to a sports club right across the river, right across a two-mile river that might as well be like crossing the Atlantic Ocean, you see a very different story start to unfold. So notice how most of the activity is actually very different from what we saw with the one downtown Manhattan. You see a lot of this activity actually happening in Jersey City, um, in, you know, even moving a little bit up into the Hoboken area. It's funny, actually, because the only areas that we see light up in Manhattan are the ones right by the PATH station, which is a very typical um, mode of transportation across the river. So when I'm looking at these, I'm thinking about maybe where I want to do my Sunday FSI drop. These are maybe the neighborhoods that I want to focus on. If I want to do targeted, um, targeted video or, tar you know, cable zones that I want to reach um, to reach this New York sports club, enthusiasts, these are clearly the areas that I want to be able to message them in. Um, and so at the end of our demonstration, um, and so just to wrap things up, we really think that um, while it might seem a little bit overwhelming, we actually think predicting things like user behavior um, can actually be pretty simple. Um, and just like our buddy Einstein here, he looks pretty perplexed. Uh, we actually don't think it's as challenging as it might seem if you're doing it the right way. Well, great. Thanks, Gerard and Alina, for conducting today's webinar, and thanks to all of you for attending today. If you have any questions or would like to be connected with today's speakers, simply email us at webinars at the LSA.org. Also, for a look at what's coming and to access to past webinars, visit the LSA.org slash webinars. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye.